So we have four entrepreneurs who are part of our Weekend Accelerator Network. And so I wanted, Aaron, tell me your name and how your personal life and experience led you to found Aunt Bertha. Uh, my name is, <coughs> excuse me, Aaron Gray. And you know, uh, through, when I was 17 years old, my mom caught a rare disease, a brain disease called encephalitis. And, and when she got back from the hospital, she didn't know who we were. Right. And I watched my dad take care of her the best way he knew how. She really needed 24-hour care, and he didn't have the heart to do it. And for nine years, uh, sacrificing his own health, he took care of her. And when I was 26, when he couldn't take care of her anymore, I became her legal guardian. And I found out that it's very difficult to navigate the social services sector just because there's so much information and I, I changed careers and started, started looking at the problem about 10 years ago. And you built Aunt Bertha, which answers those questions for people. Exactly. So a couple years back, um, I, I used to be a programmer uh, before I changed careers. And I started writing code again. And I built a platform in Texas that makes it super easy with just your zip code to know in literally three, four seconds which programs are in your area, and with a bit more information, we even tell you what you qualify for. And it's scaled to the whole state of Texas, which is one twelfth of the American population. And so far, we've helped uh, almost 17,000 people find out about which government and charitable programs are in their area. Great, great. Ajay, <coughs> that's great. This is the why. This is the why we're doing it. Ajay, you formed Frontier Markets. Tell me the story that you remember. So uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I was working in uh, rural villages in Andhra, uh, actually working with the microfinance institution we were just talking about. Um, and um, you know, I was with these members, and we were sitting in utter darkness. Now, I don't know how many of you guys have sat in blackouts, but when you're sitting in nonstop darkness in a rural village, it's really uncomfortable. And I finally, you know, asked one of the members, I was like, you know, why aren't we, you know, putting a fire or, you know, getting a lantern or doing something to get some light so we can at least see each other's faces? And before, they said, yeah, we don't do lanterns here. And I didn't understand. Um, and basically five minutes later, we heard this incredible shrieking cry. And um, it scared me till no tomorrow. And so we kind of just all jolted up and we decided to go run to see what happened. And because I couldn't see anything, I remember tripping and falling on my face because there was no light. And um, when I got there, it was one of another members of ours um, who was just sitting holding her child, crying hysterically uh, because her child was burned. And when I asked what happened, uh, they said she must have left her kerosene lantern by the child. And he was playing with it, and essentially it tilted, it burned him, and it actually burned down the house. And so. You know, within two minutes, she lost her home and she lost her child to kerosene. And that was kind of a moment where then the members looked at me and they said, now do you understand why we don't use lanterns? And it just struck me and got me really angry thinking about why, you know, lanterns or kerosene even existed if it really kind of had this kind of impact. And now you bring solar light to... So, so, right, so the solution was, um, let's get rid of kerosene, obviously, uh, but it wasn't so easy. Um, you know, you can't just get rid of kerosene if people don't understand an alternative. And you, you have to bring in something that they can trust and that can actually last them. And so what Frontier Markets does is we actually set up an entire just last mile distribution channel for solar products, but it's not just getting the product into the hands of the households because you want to make sure that there's never kerosene there ever again. Right. So we service these products, we, hold, we do hand-holding with our customers to really understand how to make sure that you love your solar light so much so that you will never turn back to kerosene. Right. And you met Shake earlier, but Shake, tell me again just a brief founding story that led to Liberation Chocolate. Um, my name is Shaq A. I'm the founder and CEO of Liberation Chocolate. I'm from Liberia. Liberia is in West Africa bought up by Guinea, Ivory Coast, and Sierra Leone, and then by the Atlantic Ocean. Um, Liberia gained her independence since 1847. That's why we say Liberia is Africa's oldest republic. So Liberia has been known for its cocoa trade. Cocoa has been a very good produce in the country, helping poor people. 
making a living. But uh, Liberia became better known by most of you in the 1990s for its uh, long running and ruinous civil war. When I was at the age of 10, my family fled from the war in 1989, and we lived in the Ivory Coast on refugee camp for 14 years. I spent my entire childhood on a refugee camp. I was able to be educated up to high school level by the United Nations. And most of my friends who were at the age of 10, 11, 12 were recruited as former child soldiers. There was this false belief that uh, children are brave people because they never knew what they are doing. So warring factions in the country was recruiting them all over because they are brave. They don't know what they are doing. They, they are good fighters. So 14 years later, I returned back to Liberia and I saw my country in Shambo with farms overgrown as far as the eye can see and they have not been worked since the war started. And it was the period of this armament I arrived in the country. You know, and former child soldiers were giving their guns to receive just $150. These are people that were recruited when they were young. They have become adults without uh, any education, without any professional background. And then you gave them $150 to receive their gun as a token. So what would these children do after the 150 run out? Maybe after two weeks, they are again broke. I mean, so the country was not safe. They may steal, they may cause havoc. So I, I mean, started to think that uh, with this idea, the process going on cannot save the country, will not be helping Liberia. So it's a real social problem. These people that were recruited at Begin for Much Child Soldiers, some of them did not choose to do so. So there is a need that we do something. So in that regard, I mean, I started the rehabilitation of abandoned cocoa farms, and through that, providing employment opportunity for former child soldiers. And this is exactly the basic motivation and ideal behind the formation of Liberation Chocolate. Right. And to this day, we, we've employed 50 former child soldiers out of 150,000 former combatants, which is insignificant to the total amount of uh, persons we have to cover. But this is where we are, and we are here to tell you what's going on, uh, because we are far away from here. So that's it. Thank you, Shay. Yeah, right. thank you. <clears throat> So this is a market coming together, this is a sector, and it's also about entrepreneurs with a deep why. Audra, tell us about why you're working on Worldwide Hearing. Sure. Um, started with my father's story. Uh, my father grew up in Romania in the 1950s. Uh, when he was nine years old and his sister was seven, uh, they developed a severe ear infection, and because he just didn't have access to basic drugs at the time, uh, they weren't able to treat it, and they developed um, pretty severe hearing loss. And, you know, unfortunately, my father's family didn't have money to access a hearing aid at the time. And the unfortunate part is that this story is not unique. There are 180 million children out there who suffer from hearing loss. Most of them live in developing countries, and almost none of them have access to hearing aids. And that's just because hearing aids are way too expensive, and there are just not enough distribution networks in developing countries. So not enough trained people to actually fit the hearing aids. So, you know, for many children what that means, and in a lot of communities, uh, you see kids being even hidden by their parents. Um, you know, a disability is seen as a tar on the family. Um, so that's why I got involved in worldwide hearing. Right, and you have the subsidy of the hearing that goes to the poor, right? Exactly, so we've, what we've done is essentially developed a model, we call it Hearing Express, and it has three components. So the first part is affordability. So we're able to source um, hearing aids and other mobile diagnostic tools um, including um, chargers for hearing aid batteries at a fraction of the existing cost. The second part is a rapid fitting model where instead of the two weeks or more it takes to fit a hearing aid, we're able to do that under one hour. And just to give you an example, I had my hearing test done in Montreal recently. It took two months, three visits to a medical professional, and 90 bucks. Um, so imagine for a kid in a developing country who has to walk half a day to get the nearest health clinic. It's not feasible. So we're able to do all of that in an hour. And the third part is a distribution network that uses social entrepreneurship. 
So we have an accreditation center run by an audiologist who then trains local entrepreneurs, typically female entrepreneurs, to become audio technicians in less than five weeks. So just enough to be able to fit, um, to do a hearing test, fit a hearing aid, um, and make a living from that in local communities. Yeah, thank you. So there's more than 100 entrepreneurs here in the conference, like, and uh, more than 100 that have been scholarshiped, about 50 or 60 or, or 80 others. So probably a couple hundred people out of the 1,600 people that are here. They've all got a story. And they've got a story of why they do it. And because this is not easy, as they've been talking about with the Rockefeller Foundation, with the Midiar, this is not easy. It's not easy for the, for the innovators. But this is the reason why. So we just want to put that face with it before we go on. I want to thank you to all the entrepreneurs and all the others who are here.